And our first evening tonight uh, that we're all here for is to hear some speakers, both faculty and Concordia students that are going to present a little bit about uh, their experience, their ties to the Eurasian region in, uh, um, in the next 40, 45 minutes or so. Uh, we have a total of four presentations and so we'll go back to back with those. It should run in between 10 or a little over 10 minutes each. And then towards the end of the evening, we'll have a chance to ask questions of the speakers. If you have those, if you want to jot those down, we'll take those via chat or uh, we'll open up the floor to be able to ask your question directly to one of the presenters that you want to uh, find out more about. So we're, we're excited to hear questions that you may have as well. Uh, I want to thank the International Center for their help in putting this on. Rebecca Kellogg is here and she's helped to put a lot of this together and, and bring a number of the folks here in the room together for this presentation. And also we thank the School of Arts and Sciences for helping to put this on. And we're thankful to the presenters and a number of the faculty tonight that will present are from the School of Arts and Sciences and particularly from the Department of History. So we're delighted to have you all as well. And of course, we have our, uh, a couple of our wonderful international students here that are going to present to us also. So it's my honor and privilege to uh, to kick things off and, and to welcome our, our and introduce our presenters. And we'll go first to Dr. Van Mobley, who is going to present to us on the geopolitics of the Eurasian region. And I'll just briefly introduce Dr. Mobley if you don't know him. Dr. Mobley has worked in business, politics, and industry. He earned his doctorate from UW Madison. Uh, he's been a professor at Concordia since 2001. And uh, in 2012, he was elected Thienesville president. Uh, folks on the Ann Arbor side, if you don't know Thienesville, is a uh, village tied very uh, closely to Mequon, where our campus is here on the Wisconsin side. And welcome, Dr. Mobley. We're delighted to have you. Thank you for having me, Brian. And uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, to. Um, could you lead back up that, that picture that we had earlier? Could whoever had the picture up, could they put that back up? Rebecca, do you have that? You could put that back on the screen for us. Yes, is this the one you were wanting? That's the one I'm wanting. That, that gives us a map of Eurasia. That'll be helpful. I'll just refer to that as I give you a little talk. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight. I'm sorry, I have, um, to be quite frank, I, I have a lot of classes this semester and my voice has collapsed from bellowing through a mask. So I'm hoping that we'll be done with the mask soon. I know that it's taking an impact on my, my uh, vocal cords, but I think the key to understanding the geopolitics of the Eurasian landmass is uh, continuity and change. And I think that uh, one of the things uh, that's continuous is for a professor like myself who's trained in the United States uh, is, is if we just take a look at it from the American perspective. Uh, this may not be the perspective that other people have on the geopolitics, but it's the one that I'm most um, familiar with. And I think it does offer an interesting insight on how things will change. Uh, throughout the, the second half of the 20th century, the Eurasian landmass was dominated by the Cold War and the, the geopolitical configurations that went with that. And what we saw in particular was the United States uh, with its allies predominantly in Western Europe, the leading Western nation, nation states of Western Europe, looking to contain communism with the heart of the communist being in the USSR. Um, also, uh, in it, during that conflict, uh, we really looked to pick up as many allies as we could um, around the Eurasian landmass. So we had uh, a lot of interest in maintaining an American presence in, for example, the Middle East. Uh, we vied with the Soviets for, uh, for influence in India, former British colony. And then China, of course, was the huge sort of nation floating there that went from strictly subordinate in some ways, not never really with Mao, but 
uh, aligned with the Soviets to sort of a communist, very large and powerful nation operating on its own. And then, of course, we always have to remember Japan, which after World War II was the United States primary ally in the region. And, and in many ways, from my perspective, the most important ally that the United States has in the entire world. Um, with the end of the Cold War, it wasn't sure how the lineup of Eurasian geopolitics would operate, but in fact, it's beginning to come into focus. And I think that, that what increasingly we will see is we will see the United States leading a global alliance system with its major allies of Great Britain off the European continent and Japan off the Asian continent, and then the United States growing ever closer allied to India. When the, when the American and India alliance as that grows and matures, it has certain ripple effects. Among them being, you'll see the United States less uh, active in the Middle East. Um, and as we ally with Hindu India, there is always a religious component to that. Then I think that you will see other countries begin to ally with and, and active in the Middle East. Um, I also think that what we're gonna see is China increasingly take a larger role in the world and in the Eurasian landmass. And I think that they will find allies, if not allies, at least, you know, friends and acquaintances, European continent, in particular, France and Germany. So I think that instead of having the traditional West against the East, then actually we're going to see it sort of a more of a Chinese and European sort of alignment of some sorts. And the United States will be allied once again with Britain, India and Japan being our primary allies. The key swing play this is uh, of the old Russia. Um, I know it had been a, an objective of the Trump administration to forge a warmer relationship with Russia. I certainly think that makes geo geopolitical sense for the United States. And there are signs that the Biden administration are gonna go that way as well. So I think as we go this way in the future, um, we'll see a new geopolitical alliance system emerge more along the lines of 19th century great power politics, but the alignment will roughly be the United States, Britain, India, Japan, and Russia coming in and doing an out of alignment with that group. And then you'll have China and Europe more closely allied and more active in the Middle East. So that's sort of the way I see the geopolitical changes coming. Um, I think that uh, people might, uh, sometimes they may be frightened of such changes, but I think that that actually affords an opportunity for a stable, peaceful, and actually cooperative uh, Eurasian landmass. So I'm hopeful for the future. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Mobley. We appreciate your, your uh, opening us up and, and uh, giving us a little bit of perspective on, on the geopolitics of the region. Thank you so much for presenting. We, Hopefully you can stick around and, and hear some questions from, from the student participants at the end. But thank you again. We move now to our, our second presentation and we have uh, a student presenters uh, for our second slot. And they're Thomas Dazinger and Melly Egel. And they are our student international graduate students here at Concordia, both pursuing master's of business degrees with an emphasis on international business. And they're going to do a joint presentation on their home country of Austria. So we're very excited to, to hear from Thomas and Nelly. Welcome to, uh, to uh, this evening and, and to present. You should have access to be able to share your screen if you'd like to do that. And mm -hmm. so yep. I'm yeah. currently working on it. Oh, perfect. I okay. I think. Are you able to see it? Or we are, it... yep. Okay, perfect. perfect. <laughs> Okay, so it seems to be working. All right, so thanks again so much for giving us the opportunity to present today. And again, a warm welcome and good evening, or actually more of a good morning in Austria because it's already past 2 a.m. here. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're gonna give you a little presentation about our home country, Austria. And I think we'll already start with it because we do have a quite limited time to present it. So let's get right into it. Okey-doke. So the first part is a little bit of a presentation about ourselves. And we're going to start off with our home uh, university in Austria. Um, and it's the University of Applied Sciences in Upper Austria. Um, it's got four campuses. And the one we're staying at is uh, located in Steyr. 
and our degree program is called Global Sales and Marketing. And there's both the bachelor version and the master's version of it. And the thing that makes our degree program a little bit special is that it's uh, there's a whole variety of focuses in that program. The main one is uh, in marketing and sales in B2B, but also a lot of intercultural management and mechatronics. And also all of our courses are taught in English, so that's pretty fun. Um, and something that's also very special with our program uh, in particular is that we have a, a mandatory semester abroad both in our undergrad and in our graduate program. So both Melly and I already did a semester abroad before we got to uh, Concordia, which was in Belgium for both of us. And yeah, Melly's going to tell you a little bit about our uh, Concordia stay. Yes, so the University of Applied Sciences, or our specific study program, has a double degree contract with Concordia. So that was one of the main reasons why we chose to spend our semester abroad um, in America at Concordia University. We got to America in April this year and we stayed until August. So we stayed for two summer terms and we were enrolled in MBA courses there, which are part of which allow us to um, pursue a double degree that gives us both an MBA later on, as well as the Master of Arts that um, we're doing at our home university. Mm -hmm. Yep, and so we've got our little map right here of Europe, and Austria is this little tiny speck in the middle, uh, right next to Germany, as you can see right here. And I think Melly's going to give you a couple of facts right now. Yes, so size-wise, um, Austria is 32,000 square miles uh, large, which is just about half the size of Wisconsin. So tiny. Our, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very small. Our um, language we speak is German, but um, we are also, we have a variety of dialects um, and variants of German that we speak. So most people that learn proper German have a hard time um, integrating language wise because it's still very different from how you, you learn German at school. And our currency, our, euros because we've been part of the European Union and um, we got the euro in 1999 so it has mm -hmm. been like that for a long time now. Yep so I'm gonna give you just about the briefest history lesson ever. Um, so about 800 BC was about the first time that uh, settlements have been uh, around in Austria which has been called the Celtic Hallstatt culture. Um, and for a long time, the Romans have been in Austria because it's right next to Italy as well. And at around uh, 1000 AD, uh, the name Austria was mentioned for the very first time ever. Um, and then between the uh, 1200s and 1900s, uh, the Habsburgs reigned in Austria, which was a monarchy back in the days. But then at the end of World War I, of course, um, it was abolished. So uh, after the 1918 war, uh, or after World War One, uh, we had a republic instated, and then, of course, uh, between 1939 uh, and 1945, we had World War Two, which is a whole different subject that we're not going to talk about too much in detail because that would probably fill an entire lecture by itself. Um, and from 1955 on, uh, we've been an independent country, and we've had our second repu republic instated. So yeah. Now for a little more specific stuff. So the Republic of Austria has a few cities that are more well known and a few cities that are less well known. Our capital and the city most people know about is Vienna. Um, but a few other larger cities that we've occasionally, especially in America, have heard that people know about are Innsbruck, Salzburg and Graz. And for us specifically, um, and the cities we want to get into detail with a little bit more, um, as Thomas mentioned before, we study in Steyr in Upper Austria. I am from Munden, which is uh, near a lake, which makes it somewhat known to at least a few people. And Thomas is going to talk about his hometown ends for a bit. Yep, so I'm gonna get right into it. Uh, so these are a couple of pictures of my hometown. We've got this lovely watchtower right in the middle. 
And actually the thing that makes Enns uh, a little outstanding from other towns in Austria is that it's the oldest town in Austria. It's been founded in 1212 AD. Uh, but yeah, that's basically it <laughs> already. So I think we're going to jump to Melly's hometown. So for Munden, as you can see, um, as I mentioned, we have the lake. And in the first picture with the little castle, that is actually called Schloss Ort. And it is a very popular destination in Munden just because um, it's very popular for uh, weddings. My mother got married there, um, but also for Christmas markets, for example. And it is one of the sites that is just immediately associated um, with my hometown. But as you can tell by the other pictures, um, Besides the lake, we're also very close to the mountains. We are in the region that is considered um, the, the bordering regions of the Alps. So we're, we are basically where mountains are starting to become more and more. And um, so we have our little uh, uh, cable car that goes up one of the mountains, but we also have the um, what we call in German Baumwipfelweg. So it is on top of where the tops of the trees are, and it gives you a very nice view down onto the lake. And Gmunden also has a very pretty city center, which is great for strolls because as mentioned, right next to the lake. So always a nice view. And then we have Steyr, the city Thomas and I study in, um, which is also right nearby the water, but nearby um, the rivers. And um, it's also very popular, mainly for its very um, old city center, which is very beautiful and pretty to walk through. The picture on the bottom, I believe it's not in that picture because it was added very recently. But um, if you look up towards the right, um, next to the little building up there, um, there's actually, a, there has been a platform installed to get a nice view over the city. So. Chair is also very popular and very beautiful to walk through. And this picture yeah. shows our university campus. It shows the first and second building. Um, and there has, as the big 25 indicates, um, been uh, an anniversary recently. And with that came the new building um, that has been, I think opened the last two years ago, I believe. So it's the very the newest building and the newest addition to our campus. Yeah. So now we're coming to part two, a little bit of our, about our culture in Austria. And I think we're going to start off with sports. Yes. So the two most popular sports in Austria um, during summer, I would say, is what we refer to as football, what we started to refer to as soccer in America. And for winter, it's definitely skiing. We're better in winter sports than in summer sports, but that doesn't mean that we do not enjoy to play soccer as well. Even I, though... A pretty wide margin, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the next thing we're going to talk about real quick are the traditional clothings. Um, so most people are probably going to associate this with um, Germany more so than Austria. Uh, because it's much more prevalent there with all the Oktoberfest and all that stuff. But it's actually just as traditional in Austria as it is in Germany. Actually more so, I'd say, in Austria than in Germany, because in Germany it's all almost entirely confined to the southern part, which is bordering Austria. <laughs> so yeah, we have this one thing called Liederhosen, which is mostly worn by men um, as our traditional outfit. And uh, for women, we have the Dirndl, well, Dirndl, if you would pronounce it in the German way. Uh, so yeah, these are our traditional outfits or traditional clothing in Austria. Uh, for food and beverages, um, starting off with food, what we would name as the first food when people ask us what is typically Austrian, it would be um, the Wiener Schnitzel, which is traditionally served uh, with potato salad, but there are many variations of it. and. Some people like to have it, like you can see in the picture with uh, boiled potatoes. And for sweet dishes that um, we like, um, the one we chose, even though there are very many to choose from, is Kaiserschmann, 
which is a fluffy pancake that is already um, cut into tiny squares or tiny pieces in the pan and served yep. very similarly to the picture that Thomas chose for the presentation. Yep. Uh, concerning beverages. Presentation on that. Uh, concerning beverages, it turns out that um, all of like most of our more traditional beverages are alcoholic. So um, I think I believe beer is very commonly associated with Germany again. But I am pretty sure that within Europe um, we rank as the second um, na like concerning beer consumption, we're the second highest ranking nation. We also have a lot of uh, wine regions in Austria um, and a lot of schnapps is also made in Austria. Yeah, um, concerning holidays, we have actually quite a few holidays, but uh, again, we have to sort of smush them all together and uh, we have to agree on a couple uh, important ones. So the, one we, the ones we uh, went with were Christmas, of course, um, which is very much celebrated in, Aus celebrated in Austria. This is again in Melly's hometown um, during Christmas time, the little castle that's floating uh, on the water, which is very nice. And this is in my hometown with the watchtower in the back. You can see uh, it's in the courtyard of the castle. Um, Easter, of course, is also pretty important. Um, and lastly, our national, hol national holiday um, is also kind of important. It doesn't really compare to the national holiday uh, in the United States on the 4th of July, of course. <laughs> uh, yeah. Then moving on to some brands that have become popular outside of just Austria. Um, the first one is Mana, which is mostly known for the product you can see in the picture again, our Mana wafers. And so far, everyone, I or we have had tried these was absolutely in love with them so they're a very popular candy uh, originating in austria a very common um, drink is or a drink that everyone at least knows is red bull and it also has its roots in austria and the last brand is rovsky um, again i would say very well known all around the world but originated in austria too yeah, and our final part, part three, uh, are a couple of do's and don'ts uh, if you ever want to come to Austria, which we very much hope, of course. Um, so Melly's going to start us off with a couple of do's, which you want to do. Um, exactly. So first of all, we have public transport. Our public transport system is fairly good. We have a lot of buses that also connect smaller cities. We have a very good train um, system. So. Unlike America and Austria, you can definitely see a lot of the country just with public transport. You definitely do not need to have a car. It's more of a convenience. Um, Austrians really like their titles. So if someone has a PhD or a doctorate, you should definitely address people with that unless they specifically tell you that it's not important to them. Being on time is also uh, very common in Austria. We kind of stole that one from the Germans. So if you agree on a certain time, make sure that you're there five minutes early so that you can for sure start at the time that was agreed on. Um, we are also fairly polite also with our elders. So greeting elderly people um, definitely will earn you some bonus points when you're here. And um, bills at restaurants are for the most part split and letting the waiter know is no problem at all. And lastly, um, because it is very much not um, expected by us that anyone would speak any German, um, we're more than happy to see that people are interested in our language. And if you just know a few words of German and are able to introduce yourself, you will for sure again have some good bonus points from the get go. You'll get extra bonus points if you can pronounce this one. This is a crowd favorites among Austrians <laughs> if they ever want to have an American person try to pronounce an Austrian word. So if you ever want to give it a try, it's Bachkatzelschwaf. <laughs> so fairly simple, of course. Uh, but yeah, you can give it a try yourself while I go on with the don'ts because we have a couple of those as well. So one thing that you're not going to be able to do is uh, go shopping on Sundays because uh, shops are closed. 
besides maybe gas stations, um, you can get some small uh, stuff there. Um, one thing that we're very adamant about is mislabeling or mistaking Austrians for Germans. And we are going to get very upset if that ever happens. <laughs> so please don't do that. <laughs> um, the third thing is probably more of a general advice um, than specific to Austria, because it's always a little bit of a hassle to discuss politics or religion when you're abroad, especially if you don't know the region too well. Um, something that goes into the same direction is talking about World War II, because especially older people are still very conscientious about it. Um, and some of them might have even experienced it at, uh, back in the days. Um, yeah. And also, don't assume that everybody speaks English, even though Austria, uh, in terms of English proficiency, is quite good, I'd say. Maybe not um, Nordic country good, but it's fairly good, I'd say, still. Um, a lot of older folks are still not very accustomed to speaking English on a regular basis. So if you ever go up to a young person, of course, uh, chances are that they're going to be able to speak English fairly well. But yeah, not everybody, as I said. And also, lastly, um, don't litter. That's just uh, life advice, I'd say, as well. <laughs> because we are a very nature-friendly country, since the Alps make up like two-thirds of our country. But yeah, that's pretty much it for our presentation. So thanks again so much for everybody uh, for tuning in. And if you ever want to ask any question, you can always shoot us an email. Um, if you want to see more pictures, you can follow us on Instagram. <laughs> but yeah, that's pretty much it from our side. So thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thomas. It's been a wonderful job. Thank you so much for sharing. And thank you also for staying up so late to share with us. We really appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, so really, really a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. So yeah, sure. I, I, um, please please to have you we'll, we'll um just one one or two quick things as we as we continue on i forgot at the beginning of the the presentation just to ask if you are able uh those that are, are in the public if you're able to turn your camera as we're presenting so we can uh see your lovely faces i, I see most have the cameras on but i just wanted to ask you if you could do that okay we'll move into our next presentation then we have dr patrick Steele, uh, who's going to give our next talk he's from the history department at concordia university in the mechbon side of things uh, he earned his phd in american cold war history from marquette university at concordia he teaches uh, courses on asian history the vietnam war American history, the modern Middle East, and history of sports. Uh, his research interests include the Milwaukee Brewers and air power in the Cold War. And he'll be presenting on the presence of the French in Indochina and the slippery slope that led to the Vietnam War. So Dr. Steele, and you, oh, you have it up already? Okay, perfect, wonderful. So we're excited to hear from you. Well, nothing like putting pressure on me by saying you're excited, so. <clears throat> so. We'll kind of go through this. Um, when I was asked to do this, um, what came to mind immediately was within a lot of the situation going around the world, and certainly Dr. Mobley talked about it a little bit, with the shifting geopolitics in Asia right now, um, you know, the fall of Afghanistan as quickly, as rapidly as that happened, that, you know, that's a momentous historic moment. And it reminded me of several others that happened down the road, and most you know, importantly in my life when I was younger, uh, was the fall of Saigon in 1975. And, there was a lot of people who raised the question, well, why were we even in Vietnam? And so what I'm going to try to do in sometime between seven to 10 minutes uh, and two slides is kind of walk us through what actually happened. So we kind of maybe understand a little bit of a timeline. I'll touch base a little bit with Dr. Mobley's uh, presentation as well. We talk about the impact of China in this region as well, and it'll, it'll suddenly become a little bit clearer, I think. Um, but if you look at the first map that I've got up, this is a division of Southeast Asia based on occupation times of the French. Now, it was not uncommon for European powers, of course, you know, prior to the 1800s to be moving in and colonizing territory. Kind of the last great frontier was South uh, East Asia. <laughs> Excuse me. So the French made their first moves. If you look at the map very carefully, and hopefully you can see my cursor moving around, uh, into Cambodia in 1863. And if you want a timetable for that, that's right in the middle of the American Civil War and Abraham Lincoln's president of the United States. And here the French are already making moves uh, that will have an impact down the road. 
Uh, the next major move was towards uh, Cochin China, or excuse me, Cochin China was first, Cambodia second, um, Anam and Tonkin. These were the French names given to these territories. Now, between 1884 and the introduction of the French in Laos in 1893, the French pursued a policy of having the colonized pay for their own infrastructure. In essence, you're being occupied, you need to pay for this. So they had an elaborate system of taxation. Now you may be asking why would the French want to be in Southeast Asia at this time? Well, there's a lot of resources, in particular things like natural rubber, tin, manganese, uh, are uh, in many uh, resources or areas across Southeast Asia. Coffee grew really well there, and it was, you know, certainly that's important to the French. And to me, this late at night, um, we need a little bit of coffee. Um, but the French investment there went beyond just the infrastructure that they built initially. This is their crown jewel. This is the crown jewel of their empire. And so for them, this is the most important because it's also the breadbasket of Asia. There is a lot of food produced, particularly in the northern regions of what is today Vietnam, uh, into Laos. And there's a lot of surplus rice that can be sold to other parts of the world in return for French products, etc. So this is very valuable to them. During the First World War, American soldiers will tell the story of when they arrived in France, they were driven to the front by, and the term they used was Tonkinese, Tonkinese soldiers. So these were French soldiers uh, or Vietnamese soldiers that fought in the French army. They were tasked with driving Americans. And the irony then is their grandsons most likely were fighting in the American war uh, that started in the 1960s. So between World War I and World War II, as, and we'll kind of honor Thomas's, you know, idea, we're not gonna talk about World War II. So we'll say Germany went on a vacation uh, across the rest of Europe in a very ugly way. We'll leave it at that. Um, while the Germans were looking outward, the French, of course, are very concerned about what's gonna happen uh, to their empire. One of the things that they are very concerned about is maintaining control in this region for not just you know the era of the time before the war but certainly after the war if you have to rebuild an economy it was felt that if you take their colonies away france wouldn't have the ability to do this so when france is attacked in may of 1940 now i'm going to hold my fingers up very carefully here so if you look okay you can see my fingers they fought heroically for six weeks. Now, if you look, I'm not a moron. I'll say it again. France fought heroically for six weeks. Why am I holding up two fingers? Because they really only fought for two weeks. The rest of the four, the other four weeks, they spent trying to figure out a way to get out of the war, but hold on to their overseas possessions. So this was done. They agreed to an occupation and an armistice with Germany. Now, in theory, the French then would maintain their overseas empire. So as the war progressed from May of 1940 into the fall and into the winter, the Japanese had signed an alliance with the, with the Germans and the Italians. And the goal for them was you know, kind of have this axis across the world. And the Japanese, in essence, asked the Germans to tell the French that they want to occupy Southeast Asia. Now, what do you do if you're France? You just say, no. Well, if you say no, the Japanese are marching in anyways. If you say, we, oui, they're probably coming in, and now you're seen as collaborating with the Japanese here, and you're collaborating with the Germans back home. Well, during the course of the war, the Japanese occupation went fairly smoothly. The French were not really much of a resistance force until it gets close to the end when they realize the Americans are going to come and they're going to liberate this territory. So if we want to hold on to it, we better act heroically and they're going to try and do this and the Japanese will crush them. And that's something I'll deal with in a couple of moments. Meanwhile, back in the United States, the president of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, is looking at options across the globe. And one of the rare things he had in common with the Soviet Union at this time was this belief that we needed to end colonization. The colonization had been a trigger for the uh, scramble for Africa in the 1870s. It had been one of the driving causes behind World War I. 
um, certainly was one of the trigger points coming into World War II. So he made it very publicly known that his goal was to end colonization. Well, who's his ally? Great Britain. Britain is absolutely dependent upon their empire in the post-war world. This is not something they really want to hear. As the war progresses in 43 to 44, when it be, it's not just a matter of if the access powers are going to lose, it's now a matter of when will they lose. The Allies kind of look at what will happen to these territories down the road. And so they kind of start working out some scenarios as far as what do we do with some of the occupied territory, the, these colonial territories. The British, because they never fell, asserted their authority to hold on to their empire, and the United States was not going to make Britain let them go. In fact, Winston Churchill made it very clear, was not selected as prime minister to see the, you know, the sun go down on the British Empire. But what do you do with France? France has empire in Asia. France has island connections out in the Pacific. They had some land concessions in China. They've got territory in North Africa. They've got territory in West Africa. All the dominoes are going to start to fall if you make the French pull out. Meanwhile, as this debate's going on, as we get into 1945, the bigger concern is what do we do in Europe? By February 45, at the time of the Yalta Conference, where the fate of Europe is going to be decided, it was already apparent that the United States and the Soviet Union had significant issues as far as their view of what world peace was going to be. The United States wanted to follow the course of complete disarmament, like we had done in previous wars. We want to demobilize our armed forces. We want to build up our peacetime economy. The Soviets are looking at a long-term occupation of Europe. It's going to change what the Americans do. Meanwhile, there's Britain sitting there kind of in the middle between two states that want to destroy their, the colonial structure, and they begin to advocate fairly vociferously to have the French included in any kind of deal that's being cut at the end of the war. Now, I'll tell you this, I'm sitting here in 2021 and I'm looking at Dr. Mobley's face too. This is kind of a head scratcher. Why would you want the French involved in anything? What did they do? They actively collaborated with the Germans. They shot at American troops during the invasion of North Africa. They aided the Japanese in their conquest of Southeast Asia. Why would anybody want to have the French part of a German occupation force as part of anything to do with post-war Europe? Well, if you sit back and you think about it, the answer is really clear. Why does Britain do it? Britain wants another colonial power at the table. They want another colonial power at the table, so that way it's going to be harder for the United States and Soviet Union to advocate for an elimination of colonies if there's two colonies, you know, two people advocating for colonies and two opposed. Well, this is fine and good until April of 45 when Franklin Roosevelt assumes room temperature and he is replaced by Harry Truman. And Harry Truman has a far more pragmatic view of the world. Doesn't really have a lot of nice things to say about the French. He spent time in France during World War I. He is not a fan of the French or the French aspirations. Okay. Meanwhile, again, as we go through 45, it becomes clear the Americans are going to come. The French make a decision to stand up to the Japanese. The Japanese slap them down. However, this does not stop the inevitable end of the war. In August of uh, 45, of course, the United States drops an atomic bomb. Right after this, uh, within 48 hours, the Soviet Union declares war on Japan. The Japanese realize that if the war comes to an end and the Soviets are a major part of it, Japan is going to be divided. Every bit as much as Germany was um, in the post-war world, as much as North, Korea, North and South Korea are still to this day. So the Allies that came up with, in the process to end the war, um, occupation zones that were supposed to follow a simple pattern okay so hopefully this works and i can flip to my next slide i don't have fancy slides like uh, uh austria i've just got some plain kind of boring maps but the plan was relatively simple they're gonna have the nationalist chinese disarm the japanese in the northern portions of vietnam uh dividing out roughly at the at the 19th parallel the english were tasked with disarming the Japanese in the South. 
No, it's a very simple plan, right? Well, what's problematic about it? There's three things. One, the Vietnamese hate the Chinese. They view the Chinese as they're going to come in like parasites. They're going to strip all the stuff. Anything of value is going to be on a truck heading back to China. And honestly, they weren't wrong by much. The English in the South don't want to be there. They have other things. They are far more concerned about India breaking away. They don't want to have a major troop commitment here. They also still want to have a presence in the Middle East. Again, there's another connection to our um, Eurasian you know, political scene. They want to get their troops out as quickly as possible. So they cut a deal under the table that within a month of occupation, they would turn their portion of occupation over to the French. So the French slowly start to weasel their way back in. That's a word I'm going to use. They weasel their way back in and start to disarm the Japanese and try to reassert their authority into this region. Well, what starts by 1946 is a shooting war. The Vietnamese wanted independence. In fact, on the very day that the treaty was signed ending World War II, when Douglas MacArthur is saying, you know, these proceedings are now closed. There was a little old man in Southeast Asia, standing in the back of a pickup truck, reading in Vietnamese the following words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And there's Ho Chi Minh. And he was advocating for an independent Vietnam. And in any other world, the United States would have backed him up and been behind this because this made a lot of sense. It fits with Roosevelt's goal of having, you know, colonization come to an end, all this other stuff. But here's what has changed. It's not necessarily the Soviet Union or the civil war going on in China. It has everything to do with what's going on in Europe. The Soviet Union is seen as a menace. They have zero plans, it appears, to end their occupations of Eastern Europe. I don't trust Joseph Stalin, although his name means man of steel. I like to call him Uncle Joe. I don't trust him any farther than I can throw a dump truck. He has very clear aspirations to be in absolute control of Europe, not much different than what Hitler had wanted to do. A famous Austrian, by the way. See, I'm tying it all in. This is all, you know, right? So I was listening. Okay. So by 1948, there's a plan in place to rearm Germany. The idea is if you rearm Germany and we create the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, we have a buttress against Soviet expansion into what into the West. The problem is, who fears it? The French. The French were attacked by the Germans in World War I. They were attacked by them in World War II. They were attacked by them in the Franco-Prussian War. They don't want to see a rearmed Germany. So how do you get France to go along with this? You give France what they wanted, the colony back. So the United States went from standing in opposition to colonization to, in essence, supporting French reoccupation in Southeast Asia. What happened was a war for unification to eliminate French control that was going to now be viewed through the lens of anti-communism. Between 1949 and 1954, the French war effort in Southeast Asia was bankrolled by the Americans. About three quarters of their war effort was paid for by American taxpayers. In the idea that we were you know, fighting communism over there so we didn't have to fight it over here. What accelerated it, of course, was the Korean War, which broke out in uh, June of 1950. There we see communist aggression. Clearly, you know what's happening in Southeast Asia is clear to what the same thing that's happening in Korea. So therefore, the United States supported the French in their effort to keep the communists out. When the French failed at this in 1954 and agreed to withdraw by 1956, a line that was supposed to be a temporary demarcation line was agreed to divide the nation into two, Northern Vietnam and the Southern Vietnam. North Vietnam had a very popular leader. South Vietnam will struggle from 1956 till 1975 to find somebody that can fill the void. The problem is this. We stand at that boat next to Douglas MacArthur on September 2nd, 1945, as he closes the book on World War II. 
somebody would say to you, because of what's happening in Europe, 58,000 Americans are going to die within the next 20 years over this territory that most people at that time could not find on a map. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Thank you, Dr. Steele. We appreciate it. But thank you to all the presenters. I'm looking at the time and I want to allow enough time for, for questions. And so I think I will eliminate my presentation at the end because it's, I, I want to leave some time for questions. I know students will have questions. So if we, uh, let me see, uh, Dr. Steele, are you able to stop the share so that we can see everyone so I can check to see for uh, questions in the chat or if you want to raise your hand, I have the participant panel open so I can see you or if you just want to unmute and ask a question of one of the panelists, we'd love to hear a question from you to any of the speakers. Do I see any? But you can also, I can see most of you, you just can raise your hand too. I'll call on you and you can go ahead and, and ask away. Oh, I see Nicole. Go ahead. I see your hand up. Um, I had a question for the Austria people. What was the most surprising thing when you came to America to study? Hmm. That's kind of a hard question. We've gotten that question quite a lot, and I'm still not entirely sure how to answer it because going from Europe to America is probably a lot, a lot less culturally shocking than the other way around because we get so much media from the United States. Pretty much all of the movies we're watching are from the United States. But one thing that I've dreaded is pretty much every time when I was in the United States was driving, <laughs> to be fair, um, because driving is just so different from uh, Europe. Um, most of our cars are um, not ma uh, are manual uh, as opposed to uh, automatic, and I'm also not used to people passing on the right side <laughs> of the road, uh, which I think is kind of dangerous at times. Um, and specifically, I mean, in larger towns you have uh, highways with I don't know five, six lanes. In Austria, you have three at maximum, which is also way different from the United States. But yeah, it's mostly smaller stuff that's a little different, uh, but no real one large thing that sets uh, sets Austria and the United States apart, really, I think. I don't yeah. know, what do you think, Melly? I agree with Thomas. I've gotten the question quite a bit recently too from friends after coming back to Austria. And I think to me, it's mostly the, the conversational culture in America and the fact that it's much easier to have small talk and light conversation with uh, all sorts of people, which you just don't do in Austria. And also I feel like just the general approach, maybe it is also just more of a Wisconsin thing or a more local thing, but I feel like people in general are a lot friendlier. Um, when I landed in Vienna and like literally the first person I talked to in German again after five months was already in a bad mood. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, yep, that is kind of stereotypical. I don't know. Uh, it depends on where in Austria you are, of course, but Austria, even within Austria, has sort of a reputation of being grumpy all the time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I agree but... with Thomas that, that American media really prepared us for all of this in a way that we often went through supermarkets and saw products we had never tried, but they, they felt so familiar because we had seen them a million times in media, so... Yeah, I don't think you would see any American going crazy over seeing Pop-Tarts in a supermarket, but yeah, that was just our reality for a couple of months. <laughs> but yeah, good. I think Thank we have you. another question in the chat as well. You do, yeah. So what was something in Austria that you wish was in the US? Huh. That's also kind of a hard question, and I'm going to go with a weird answer on this one because I was talking about this with my dad recently, I think. 
this also relates to the grocery shopping aspect um, of life in the United States. But we have such a large variety of breads in Austria and also in Germany, of course. Uh, and I feel like <laughs> the, the United States is kind of lacking in terms of quality bread. <laughs> yeah, as I said, pretty weird answer. Probably came out of nowhere, but huh. I don't know. Apart from that, is there anything you can think of, Millie, off the top of your head? Nothing major. I did have a very funny situation um, towards the end in America because I was spending some time with American friends and there was also one more European friend there. And um, in Europe, it is very common to use, um, if for, for kitchen use, mostly reusable cloths instead of um, taking uh, kitchen towels every time for everything. Um, and it was very funny to me when said other European friend came, came into the kitchen and asked for um, these reusable cloths and all of our American friends looked at him like he was completely insane and asked him why he wouldn't just use a normal paper towel like everyone else. But it's, as Thomas said, mostly minor stuff. I think for the most part we very easily um, integrated what was just common and more available in America to our life there while we were there. Mm -hmm. Somebody in the chat said, not a serious question, what, the, what was your favorite American food you tried? I think that's a pretty clear answer for me at least, because I can't say that I've ever eaten as many hot dogs in such a short period of time ever in my life. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that's a pretty clear cut answer for me. But we've also um, gone to the state fair uh, while we were in Wisconsin, which was pretty nice. So deep fried everything just about um which was pretty nice because you would dogs. get that in austria as well um but yeah there's just i mean cheese curds obviously as well if you're in wisconsin because you couldn't go without them obviously um but yeah there's just a whole bunch of stuff that i'm already missing and it's been i don't know three weeks since we've been back <laughs> but yeah um i think you'll a, uh, yeah follow up Somebody else asked, do you think you'll ever visit the United States again? Uh, at least for me, I can say that I'll definitely go back because I have some relative relatives there as well, um, which are not in Wisconsin, but in California and in Texas and Oklahoma. Um, and it's, all, it's been already the third time that I've been in the United States, um, but I've never been in the US for such an extended period of time as for this semester abroad. And I'm gonna go ahead and guess that Melly also probably wants to go back at some point. Yes, the, the biggest relief to me personally was when, um, as I mentioned, I have a few friends in America, all over the country, also in Texas, in Massachusetts, um, in, in Oregon. And to me, the biggest relief was when my Texan friend texted me a few days ago that the American borders are going to open up most likely in November for vaccinated travelers again. So I am definitely planning to come back as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Somebody asked a uh, favorite candy. Um, like I said, I had like a, a drawer in my desk, which was always full to the brim with pop tarts. I don't know if those qualify as candy, but Anyways, I'm just going to go with that. I agree, Pop-Tarts were a pretty easy choice. I also have to admit, I really miss uh, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. They are starting oh, to yeah. become a bit more easily available here too, but it's usually either the, the smaller versions of them, and I really wish I could just have a regular-sized Reese's Peanut Butter Cup. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I think there's one last question for us. Um, was it weird coming from a terrain with many mountains to a flat area like Wisconsin? Yes, <laughs> it was very weird. Um, also coming back now to Austria, it's kind of weird seeing not flat terrain or mountainous terrain again for the first time in months. And that's actually one thing I prefer uh, Austria over Wisconsin, that there's just so many more hiking opportunities because many people in Austria just go hiking for a pastime um, or on the weekends because there's just so many opportunities uh, around here with nice mountains and lakes and all that sort of stuff. We have bars and taverns, that's where we hike too. 
<laughs> we had all those hills, nobody ever make it home from the bar. So <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Um, I have a question here. Um, somebody asked if uh, I know the genocide in Vietnam is still happening. Um, you know, one of the saddest things, um, you know, following the 1975 collapse of South Vietnam uh, was the people trying to escape on anything that floated um, to get out of there. And, you know, that that's one of the sad legacies of communist governments is the eradication of people um, that they consider to be enemies of state. This is one of the reasons why people who live through this, who have seen this, are so morally outraged when people start talking very softly or waxing poetically about communism because they don't understand what it really is, what it really meant. You know, people, like I said, they got on anything that floated with the hopes that they would end up in the Philippines because even dying on an open sea with no food was better than staying behind. That's why people tried to escape Cuba for the same reason. On anything that could float to get to Florida, they weren't going the other way. And people just lose that message today. And they, they always say, well, it's never really been, it's been tried, it's done this everywhere it's been tried. And that's why people have limited patience for it. Because again, if you want to know what's going to happen, read about it in the book, read where it's happened everywhere. So yeah, it's sad that that's still going on. So. I think Michu in chat asked uh, Melly and I a question again um, concerning the buildings and how old uh, most of them were, because most of them, at least from the looks, uh, seemed pretty old. And I can pretty much confirm that. Um, from what I mean, uh, if you can remember from what I said, I'm from the oldest town in Austria, and it's actually built on a Roman campsite, so the foundation of it is even older. So I'm basically living right on top of a of an ancient Roman campsite, which is like 2,000 years old, I think. And most of the buildings, I think, even the younger ones uh, in my hometown are at least one or 200 years years old, I'd say. Uh, I think probably the same goes for Melly's hometown as well. Yeah, I think we're not we're not as old as Ensis, obviously, because they can only be one oldest town. <laughs> but um, I think it's in general very. I would almost say European, but also Austrian to have um, a more historic looking city center, at least. Just because that is obviously where people started to crowd. And then as you look, um, as you, as it spreads out, um, you obviously will find way more modern buildings. But um, yeah, in that case, the city centers are usually very historic looking just because they've been around for a long time. Wonderful. I think there was a, a final question for Dr. Steele. The question was, what can be said of Vietnam today as in the French occupation and U.S. involvement left a lasting impact or lack thereof? Well, you know, it's funny between 1975 and 1993, uh, one of the lowest per capita income nations across the globe was Vietnam. In, uh, the, in the early 1990s, starting about 1995 on the 20th anniversary of the fall of Saigon, the Clinton administration moved to kind of normalize relations with Vietnam. Um, wait a minute, Nicole, are you driving your car right now? Please tell me you're not driving, you're riding, right? Yeah, I'm just riding in a car. Okay, all right, good. I just wanna make sure we don't have an accident here as well. Yeah. Um, so um, what happened since 95 when the Clinton administration did this is more and more American companies started investing in Southeast Asia, in particular in Vietnam. One of the big companies that is invested in there is Under Armour. So many of you, if you have Under Armour heat gear, or and I'm looking, there's a couple softball players in here. If you look at some of the gear you get with Under Armour logos on it, look at where it's made. Much of it's made in Vietnam. Um, that includes some of their hunting stuff. Some of the Carhartt stuff is made there. Um, so their economy has grown as they become more um, in tune to the rest of the Western world. And this ties in with Dr. Mobley's point too about you know, shifting paradigms in this region. If somebody would have just simply looked, been able to say, you know, look in the in the magic ball and look, say, hey, look, you know, between 1945 and 1995, we don't need to go into Vietnam. Let it do whatever it's going to be, because by the time we get into the early 21st century, we're going to be pretty close to allies uh, with the Vietnamese regarding the threat that the Chinese are. But there's one other element 
you know, to this, um, they become very prosperous with tourism. A lot of companies are leading tours of U.S. Vietnam vets and their families back to some of the areas that were fought over while the Americans fought between 1965 and 1973. In addition, there is one Lutheran body, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod, has actually gotten permission from the communist government of, South, of Vietnam to establish a seminary inside of Vietnam. And it's officially recognized by their government as having legitimacy to be there. So they're training pastors and they're sharing the word of God um, to people in Vietnam. Again, something that would have seemed to be a foreign concept to American policymakers when you watch the fall of Saigon. So I will encourage all of you, you know, that are lamenting what happened in Afghanistan. Again, who knows what we're going to be talking about in 20 years. Maybe the situation there will be dramatically worse. Maybe we'll be on the front end of a turnaround when the next generation comes along and realizes they don't want anything to do with the Taliban either. So I don't know if that really, you know, answers your question, uh, but certainly it's a dramatic different view of Vietnam now uh, than we would have seen in 1945 or certainly 1975. Very good. Well, thank you. I think we'll, we'll close on that. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. It was wonderful to hear from the presenters. Thank you so much for presenting. Thank you for coming and listening. I hope that you you come away with some new information, that you enjoyed the, the experience and that you'll come back. We have another presentation like this will be uh, more focused on the African nations in November. And so we'll be sending out information about that. And you're all welcome to come back. We hope that you will and, and learn a little bit more. Hear some different perspectives from other parts of the world and folks that are tied to those regions. Again, thank you so much. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Take care.